A very good evening aspirants welcome to Hindi newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 3rd of March 2023 displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today now without wasting any time let's start our discussion right away Now look at this news article it talks about a verdict delivered by a five judge bench of Supreme Court The judgment was on the appointment process of chief election commissioner and election commissioners. The constitution bench directed that chief election commissioner and the election commissioners will be appointed by president on the advice tendered by a committee. This committee should consist of prime minister, leader of opposition in Lok Sabha or the leader of single party in opposition and the chief justice of India. In this context let us use this opportunity to quickly revise about the constitutional provisions related to election commission of india see election commission as you all know is a constitutional body this is because it is directly established by constitution of india under article 324 now what is the purpose of election commission the purpose is to ensure free and fair elections in the country now what does the commission do See the election commission is responsible for the conduct of elections of the parliament state legislature office of president and the vice president of india so we can say that election commission is all india body as it is common to both central government and the state government now this is about the basics of election commission now we'll look into the composition of election commission see the election commission of india was a single member body when it was established in the year 1950 later in the year 1989 the election commission transformed into a multi member body clause 2 of article 324 provides that election commission shall consist of chief election commissioner and such number of other election commissioners which is determined by president from time to time that is election commission consists of chief election commissioner and other election commissioners and the number will be decided by the president I know that they are appointed by the president of India. So as of now the election commission consists of chief election commissioner and two other election commissioners and they are appointed by the president of India. Now this is about the composition of election commission. Now talking about their tenure. See the chief election commissioner and the other election commissioners have a tenure of 6 years or up to the age of 65 years whichever is earlier. So these are all some of the constitutional provisions that you have to remember about election commission. Now before concluding our discussion we'll see how the independence of the election commission is guaranteed. See to secure the independence of action of election commission article 324 contains the following provisions. Firstly the tenure of the chief election commissioner is secured. This is because the chief election commissioner can only be removed by the parliament through impeachment. To make it clear The chief election commissioner can be removed by the president on the basis of a resolution passed in the parliament and this resolution for impeachment should be passed by a special majority in both the houses of parliament and the reason for impeachment can either be on the ground of proved misbehavior or incapacity thus chief election commissioner does not hold office during the pleasure of the president even though he is appointed by the president This is the first provision which ensures the independence of election commission. Now the second one is when we look into the services of condition of chief election commissioner it cannot be varied to his or her disadvantage after the appointment. And another important thing you should note here is that other election commissioners or regional commissioner cannot be removed from office except on the recommendation of the chief election commissioner. Now that's all regarding the constitutional provisions of election commission. See in this discussion we saw static portion take note of all of these points revise it again and again because prelims is coming nearby and you have to save a lot of facts into your mind and then reciprocate it in your examination. Now these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion. Now look at this lead editorial displayed here. It talks about India's position on Russia Ukraine conflict. As many of you know already, Russia Ukraine conflict has recently entered its second year. See US and its allies had been nudging India from the start of the conflict to condemn the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. 
But India has not paid any attention to this particular demand of the Western bloc led by US. For instance, in the month of February, US and its allies moved a United Nations General Assembly resolution condemning Russia. As usually, India abstained from voting on the resolution. See, this is not happening for the first time. It has happened before also. India has continuously abstained from voting on any of the resolutions passed in UNGA regarding Ukraine war. And this is being particularly done to maintain good relationship with Russia. See, the article given here discusses about India's stand on Russia-Ukraine conflict, how US sees the conflict and what India can do in these testing times. So, in our discussion today, let us look at these points that are discussed in the article. But before that, the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. See, firstly, as I already said, India from the start refused to condemn Russia for the invasion of Ukraine. It even stepped up its purchase of Russian oil as it was offered at a cheap rate from the market value. And this strategic position of India has triggered sharp responses from the West. See, before the start of the Ukraine war, there was a feeling that India has finally started an irreversible move towards the Western countries with respect to its strategic considerations. As we know, in the recent past, India started moving closer to US and the Western allies. But that changed because of India's stand on Ukraine issue. This is because India took a stand which was opposite to that of US and its allies. Now with this information, let us look at how US looks at the Ukraine conflict. See, the Western bloc led by US sees the Russia-Ukraine conflict as a conflict between autocracy and democracy. US feels that to preserve the rules-based world order, Russia must be defeated. And this is the feeling of US. And to achieve this purpose, it wants all democracies around the world to condemn the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. But the author feels that US has not been able to achieve this purpose. He says that outside the traditional US allies, US has not been able to bring democracies like India and South Africa to condemn the Russia's actions. Even Brazil, the largest democracy in South America, has not joined the sanction system brought out by the US to financially constrain Russia. Traditional US allies like Israel and Turkey are also reluctant to join US to completely isolate Russia from the current global order. The author says that all these countries, countries like Israel, Turkey, South Africa, India, they are seeing the war as an European problem, that is between two former Soviet countries. For these countries, the war in the Ukraine is not about global democracy. But US thinks that it is about democracy versus autocracy. And this is about how US looks at the Ukraine conflict. Now let us move on to the question of morality. Is it morally right for India not to condemn a country which has invaded another country which is sovereign? The author feels that while it is morally wrong not to condemn the invasion, India does not have any other option. He feels that national interest triumphs over morality with respect to international relations. So the author is saying that it is morally wrong to not condemn the Russia. But as far as India is concerned, its own national interest comes first and then only comes morality. But the author also says that US and its allies has morality and their national interests converge with respect to this particular issue. So, for the US and its allies, morality and their national interests, they are one and the same. So, it is not harder for them to take a strong stand against the Russian invasion. But it is not the case for India. For India, the morality with respect to international relations and the national interests are different from one another. And that is why the author is saying that India does not have any other option. Now, why does the author say that? US and its allies are having the same national interest and morality. This is because their national interest is to weaken Russia. And that is why they are taking a strong stand against the Russian invasion. See, in simple words, US wants a weakened Russia. So, it is in its national interest they are condemning Russia. But this is not the case with India. India wants a strong and stable Russia to have a strategic partnership with Russia. 
So India is sidestepping the question of morality to take a stand based on its own national interest. The author says that US has done this many a times previously. It is not that US always takes a stand on international relations based on values and morality. The author quotes the example of US invasion of Iraq and Israeli occupation of Palestinian lands. See, US has not condemned any of the Israel's action regarding Palestine in the UN forums. From this, we can see that even the developed countries like US cannot make decisions independent of their national interest by focusing solely on morality. So, when a developed country like US can't make decisions solely based on values and morality, why emerging countries such as India should not put their national interest first? And this is the question of the author. And this is all about this news article given here. Now, before ending our discussion, let us see why India wants a good relationship with Russia, even though its actions are against the established world order. See, the first reason is energy. As you all know, India is importing most of its energy needs. Nearly 80% of its energy is imported from other countries. With Russia being a major exporter of fossil fuel, it can aid India with respect to its energy needs. And this is the first reason why India wants to have a good relationship with Russia. Now coming to the second reason, see most of the defense needs of India are satisfied by Russia. Here note that Russia has fulfilled over 46% of India's defense needs in the last 5 years alone. Even though India's defense purchases needs to be diversified, it would take time to move away from Russia. So for now, India is heavily dependent on Russia for its defense needs. And this is the second reason why India wants a good relationship with Russia. Thirdly, to counter the growing influence of China, India needs the help of Russia. See, Russia's relationship with China is strengthening day by day. And India, it needs to leverage its relationship with Russia to keep a check on China. Now, other than these reasons, India needs the help of Russia in building strategic relationship with countries located in Central Asia and Eastern Europe. See, these parts are where Russia is currently having significant presence. And this is exactly why India is not coming forward to condemn Russia. See, this is a good article dealing with nuances of international relations. And this editorial gives some valuable points about how decisions are taken in the international arena considering a country's own national interest. So kindly make note of all of these points that we have discussed in this article and use it in your essay and GS2 paper for your mains examination. Now with this we have come to the end of this particular article discussion. Through this discussion we saw some points relating to India's stand on Ukraine conflict and how it is opposite to that of the US and also about the different factors which are determining India's stand on this issue. Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now look at this news article, the Telangana government has filed a petition in Supreme Court and this is on account of the refusal of governor to act on several bills passed by the state legislature. In this context, now let us learn about the veto powers of president and the governor. See, first of all, we'll see what is veto power. In simple words, the power to say no or to stop an official action is called as veto power. It is the power of the president or the governor to refuse or not to take any action on a bill passed by legislature. In Indian context, there are three types of veto powers. First is the absolute veto which means the power to withhold the assent to bill. The second one is suspensive veto and this gives the power to return the bill to the parliament for reconsideration. And the last one is pocket veto. See, this is the power to not act upon the bill. These are all three types of veto powers in India. Now we'll see the comparison between veto powers of governor and president. First of all, with regards to ordinary bill, See, if a bill is presented to president after it has been passed by both the houses of the parliament, he has three options. He can give assent to the bill, the bill becomes an act. He can withhold the assent to the bill and the bill ends and does not become an act. This is only absolute veto. Or in the third case, he can return the bill for reconsideration. 
but if the bill is passed by both the houses again with or without any amendments and presented to the president's assent now the president must give assent to the bill so here the president enjoys only suspensive veto so this is regarding the veto power of president now let us see the case of governor see with regards to ordinary bill governor has four alternatives he can give assent to the bill he can withhold assent to the bill he can return the bill for reconsideration of the house and finally the fourth option is he can reserve the bill for the consideration of president now if the state bill is reserved by the governor for the consideration of president now the president again has three options he can give assent to the bill he can withhold the assent to the bill or he can simply return the bill for reconsideration of the house of state legislature now if the bill is returned the house has to reconsider it within 6 months here note that if the bill is passed again and presented to the president here the president is not bound to give his assent to the bill see when the governor reserves a bill for the consideration of the president the governor will not have any further role in the enactment of that particular bill and this is with regards to the ordinary bill now we'll see what happens in a money bill see when a money bill is passed by parliament and presented to the president he has two options he can give assent to the bill the bill becomes an act or he can withhold assent to the bill in this case the bill ends and does not become an act here note that president cannot return a money bill for reconsideration of the parliament now let us say that governor has reserved a money bill for the consideration of the president in this case also the president cannot return a money bill for reconsideration to the state legislature so as far as money bill is concerned president does not enjoy suspensive veto now let us see the governor's case when it comes to money bill the governor can give assent to the bill withhold assent to the bill or reserve the bill for consideration of the president here also the governor cannot send the money bill back to the assembly for reconsideration now that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about what is veto power types of veto power in india and the comparison of veto powers of governor and president with these points let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this text in context article this article is talking about the sri lankan financial crisis In early 2022 Sri Lanka was hit by an unprecedented financial crisis and Sri Lanka is still struggling to get out of this financial stress See the ongoing financial crisis is due to the economic mismanagement corruption and the shortage of foreign currency The data is showing that this economic crisis is the worst since Sri Lanka's independence from Britain in 1948 and this economic crisis is driving millions of people into poverty apart from this the crisis also threatens people's right to health education and an adequate standard of living see in march 2022 large scale protests were carried out against the erstwhile rajapaksha government because of this economic crisis and this forced the resignation of president gotbaya rajapaksha and subsequently ranil vikramasinghe became president on july 21 2022 so the new government has been taking many steps in restructuring the debts and also negotiating with the international monetary fund for the bailout package and this is the background of the sri lankan financial crisis now in this discussion we'll understand about the ongoing crisis in sri lanka and some important points mentioned in the news article but before that quickly go through the syllabus that i have highlighted here for your reference now first of all let's start with issues surrounding the imf bailout package to the sri lanka as i said earlier the new sri lankan government led by mr ranil is looking for a bailout package from the imf and sri lanka is expecting to get around 2.9 billion dollars package from the imf over a period of 4 years starting by the end of this month that is march and out of this expectation see sri lanka had a hope that it would get imf package by the end of last year itself that is 2022 but the process was delayed this is because of delay in getting written financing assurances from china japan and india 
Remember, to get a bailout package from IMF, Sri Lanka needs to get financial assurances from its top three bilateral creditors and assurances must be submitted before the IMF to get the fund. And this is the condition. And know that India, Japan and China are top three bilateral creditors to Sri Lanka. And that is exactly why assurances from these countries are required. See, India took the lead and sent its assurances to IMF fund this January. Following India's assurances, Japan also provided assurances to IMF fund. Now, China's written financial assurances are only pending. Therefore, Sri Lanka is expecting an IMF package by the end of this month, either with China's assurance or with assistance from other financial lenders of Sri Lanka. See, the IMF program will help Sri Lanka to become more credit worthy in the eyes of global lenders like World Bank or the Asian Development Bank and the bilateral partners or private creditors. And this is all about the issues surrounding the IMF package to Sri Lanka. Now with this information, let us move on to see about the ongoing economic crisis. See, many economists argue that it is the corruption in the first place that led Sri Lanka to this crisis. The corruption was also coupled with Sri Lanka's tendency to implement populist welfare measures. Here, populist welfare measures or populist welfare programs means implementing programs which are attractive to the common public. And the researchers said that the welfare programs are unsustainable and it did not create any valuable outcomes. And these moves only made the economy of Sri Lanka fragile over a period of time. So, corruption is the foremost cause of economic crisis in Sri Lanka. So, according to economists, corruption is the foremost cause of economic crisis in Sri Lanka. And apart from this, some economists are also of opinion that IMF package itself will create some problems rather than providing solutions. This is because of the extreme measures that were taken by Sri Lanka to receive the package. See, researchers argue that the extreme measures will affect the people as a whole. If we see in depth, the extreme measures will especially impact the working class of Sri Lanka that is worst affected in this crisis. The worker unions are also currently protesting against the sharp increase in taxes and utility bills. And these are all extreme measures. See, these tax measures were introduced by the government in the anticipation of IMF program. So, the worker unions are resisting the specific policy measures that are hurting them. Therefore, the IMF bailout package itself creates some problems for Sri Lanka. And thirdly, food security is also another problem. Over the last year, poor families in Sri Lanka have been forced to reduce their food intake drastically. See, the price of eggs, fish and meat have also increased over a period of time. So, medical practitioners are now worrying about the nutrition levels in the community. Recently, the World Food Programme also estimated that 33% of Sri Lankan households are food insecure. Now, these are all the major ongoing problems in Sri Lanka. And this is what is given in this text in context article. I have just summarized this for you. You just take note of all these points. And with this, we have come to the end of this particular article discussion. In this discussion, we saw the background of economic crisis of Sri Lanka. We saw issues revolving around the IMF bailout package. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing the ongoing problems in Sri Lanka. Now, with these points, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, look at this article here. The chief economic advisor has said that the GDP growth for the current fiscal will exceed the projected 7% growth. And this is a very positive sign. Although the numbers are not important for this discussion, the basic concept of GDP is only important. So, we'll use this opportunity to learn about the GDP. See, in technical terms, gross domestic product is the final monetary value of goods and services produced within the country during a specific period of time. Here, I'm saying final value because we don't consider the intermediate goods for the calculation. The reason for not including them in the GDP is because it will lead to counting the value of goods twice. Let me tell you this with an example. Let us say I am manufacturing a car. I sell the car for 4 lakhs. 
Now, if I want to know how much is the final value of the sale, I take the car price, then the price of the engine and then the price of other components. Am I right? Here, I should only consider the price of car because the engine and the other components are the parts of the car and they are ingredients that went into making of the car. If I count that, it does not make any sense. And this is why we don't consider the intermediate goods for GDP calculation. Now I hope you get it. So we can simply say that GDP is the measure of country's economic output in a year. Now how is it useful? See GDP is used to estimate the size of an economy and its growth rate. So it basically provides an economic snapshot of a country. Now with this basic information let us see how it is calculated. See there are three methods to calculate GDP. The first one is expenditure method and the other one is income method and the final one is production method. See in the expenditure approach you add up the various types of spending which occurs within the economy. Firstly consumption is all the spending that the households do on goods and services. For example the amount of apples a household purchases. Now secondly, investment is the spending that the firms do in machinery and equipment to operate their businesses. For example, purchase of a new plane for an airline company. Now thirdly comes the government spending. It is the spending of the government within the economy. For example, government spending on health care. And finally comes the net exports. This exports, that is exports minus imports. In essence, it is the value of what is sent overseas minus the value of stuff that comes here. And this is about the expenditure approach. And it includes all these four factors. And then comes the income approach. It is when you add together all factor payments to calculate the GDP. Factor payment means all the payments that go into the factors of production. You all know what are all the factors of production, right? It includes land, labor, capital and entrepreneurship. You give rent for the land, wages for labor and interest for the capital. In return, we get the profit which counts for the entrepreneur's effort. So adding all this, we get the GDP and this is by the income approach. And finally comes the production method. It is where we calculate the total value of all goods produced in the economy minus the value of intermediate goods. And this is about the basics of GDP and its calculation. Here you should know about another concept which is gross national product which is GNP. See GNP is nothing but GDP of a country plus its income from abroad which means here the transboundary economic activities are also taken into consideration. So we can say that gross national product of India is the value of all goods and services made by Indians regardless of the production location. And that is why the name is GDP and GNP. D is domestic, so it happens within the territory of the country. But in GNP, it takes the value of goods and services made by Indians regardless of the location of production. See the company may be in US. But if it is an Indian company, then the value of goods produced will be calculated in the GNP of India. But if you see, GDP counts for the value of all goods and services within the boundary of India, regardless of who makes it. Whether it is a foreign company also, it comes under GDP. Now that's all for this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about what is GDP and its significance and how it is calculated and finally we understood what is the difference between GDP and GNP. Now with these points let us move on to the next article discussion. Now according to this article here Congress has gained ground in assembly by-elections. Yes, the results of by-elections to six assembly seats in five states were announced yesterday. Of the six seats, the party won three seats and in this background let us quickly go through state assembly elections and when by-elections will happen. But before that, the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. See, for starters, we know that in India, there are three levels of government. That is, central level, state level and local level. At the central level, elections are conducted to elect the members of parliament, which is known as Lok Sabha elections. 
For Lok Sabha election, the whole country is divided into 543 constituencies and each constituency elects one representative as a member of parliament. Now at the state level, an election is called assembly election. However, unlike center, each state is divided into a different specific number of assembly constituencies. And the elected representative in the assembly election is called as member of legislative assembly, that is shortly referred as MLA. See, every citizen of India has the right to vote, to elect a representative as well as to be elected as a representative. So, to provide a fair opportunity to a candidate belonging to weaker sections in an open electoral competition, a system of reserved constituency is adopted. Under this system, some constituencies are reserved for people belonging to scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in a proportion to their population in a particular region. See, in a reserved constituency, only the persons belonging to the reserved category are eligible to contest an election. So, this reserved system ensures equal opportunity to all and provides a real choice of election to the voters from weaker sections. See, political parties introduce their candidates and give them the party ticket. And a candidate who wishes to contest an election has to fill a nomination form and deposit some money as security fee. And some candidates may contest elections independently. Such a candidate who doesn't belong to any political party is called as independent candidate. So if you need to contest an election, you can contest it independently also or you can join a political party and through the party ticket you can contest an election. See in any ways the candidate have their own ideology to propagate. Such ideology will be propagated through election campaign. Apart from this, the candidates have a particular code of conduct which should not be breached at any cost. Now coming to the other aspects of the election. See, the election commission takes decision on every aspect related to election. It starts from announcement of elections to declaration of results. See, the election commission supervises and controls the administration of elections. It checks and corrects any fault immediately. The election commission implements the code of conduct and punishes any candidate who is found guilty of any violation of this code of conduct. And during the election period, the election commission acquires powers to order the government to follow settled guidelines. This is to prevent the use and misuse of governmental power to enhance their chance to win the election. And also know that all the officers and staff of the government who are put on election duty works under the control of election commission and not under the government. Yes, they are government servants, but when they are put on election duty, they work under election commission and not the government. And for conducting elections, the election commission of India prepares a timetable for election. A particular day is fixed for polling in a particular constituency. And this day is called as election day. And after the declaration of the results, the candidate will take oath and be elected as member of legislative assembly or a member of parliament. And this is about the elections in general and about elections in parliament and state legislative assembly. See, usually a state assembly election will happen every five years. But there are certain cases where by-election will be conducted. See, by-election is nothing but an election held in a single political constituency. See, its major objective is to fill a vacancy. Now, we'll understand when and all by-election will be conducted. See, if you want to know this, you should know when a seat will be vacant. Then only by-election will happen, right? So, if we know when a seat will be vacant, then you will know the answer to when by-election will be conducted. Now let us see when a member of state legislature vacates his seat. Firstly, during double membership. See, a person cannot be a member of both the houses of state legislature at one time. If a person is elected to both the houses, that is state legislative assembly and state legislative council, his seat in one house falls vacant as per the provisions of law made by the state legislature. Now secondly, at the time of disqualification, a seat becomes vacant. If a member of the state legislature is disqualified, then his seat becomes vacant, right? So this is the second scenario. 
thirdly at the time of resignation see a member may resign his seat by writing to chairman of legislative council or speaker of legislative assembly and the seat falls vacant when the resignation is accepted and fourthly at the time of absence see a house of state legislature can declare the seat of a member vacant if he is absent from all its meeting for a period of 60 days without the permission of the house and finally there are other cases where a member has to vacate his seat in either house of the state legislature and these cases are if the election is declared void by the court or if the member is expelled by the house or if the member is elected to the office of president or the office of vice president or if the member is appointed to the office of governor of a state so in all of these cases the seat of a member becomes vacant and with this we have come to the end of this particular article discussion in this discussion we saw about elections that are happening in india we saw central level and state level elections we saw the procedure and we saw some important details regarding election and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the scenarios where the seat of a member becomes vacant now with these points let us move on to the next article discussion now look at this final article here The news is that last Wednesday the Tamil Nadu government signed a memorandum of understanding with the United Nations Environment Program. This is to develop an urban cooling program in the state. The cooling program is being undertaken under the framework of Cool Coalition and the India Denmark Green Strategic Partnership. And this is the crux of the news article given here. So in this context we are going to learn about Cool Coalition from exam perspective. See the Cool Coalition is a global multi-stakeholder network. It strives to facilitate knowledge exchange and joint action towards a rapid global transition to efficient and climate friendly cooling. Currently we are witnessing the increasing incidence of heat waves, right? It is affecting both the health and well-being of the people. And there is a growing demand for cooling to keep people healthy. By this time we also need to look at the effects that are going to arise out of the cooling plan and this is where cool coalition comes into picture as i said already the cool coalition aims to facilitate efficient and climate friendly cooling apart from this the cool coalition aims to link the action across the kigali amendment to the montreal protocol paris agreement and the sustainable development goals as we all know paris agreement is legally binding international treaty on climate change it was adopted by 196 parties at the un climate change conference in paris in december 2015 see this is a brief about paris agreement to know about the kigali amendment we have to first understand montreal protocol the montreal protocol is a global treaty that was designed to protect the ozone layer This is done by phasing out the production of numerous substances that are responsible for ozone depletion. Now coming to Kigali amendment, it was adopted by 197 countries on October 15, 2016. This amendment aims to phase down the hydrofluorocarbons. Know that hydrofluorocarbons are man-made organic compounds and it is also a greenhouse gas. See HFC that is hydrofluorocarbons is not directly linked with ozone depletion but these HFC emissions cause the increased warming of the stratosphere this in turn speeds up the chemical reactions that destroy ozone molecules therefore in 2016 under the Kigali amendment to Montreal protocol countries have committed to cut the production and consumption of HFCs by more than 80 percentage over the next 30 years. So I am talking about all these things because earlier I mentioned that the Cool Coalition strives to link actions across Kigali Amendment to Montreal Protocol, Paris Agreement, and the Sustainable Development Goals. Right. So you have to know what actions are linked by Cool Coalition. That's why we saw a brief about all these agreements. Now let's move on to see about the. stakeholders of cool coalition see the cool coalition connects a wide range of key actors from government cities international organizations businesses finance academia and social society groups 
know that cool coalition promotes a cross sectoral approach to meet the cooling needs of both industrialized and developing countries and this is done through better building design energy efficiency renewable energy sources while phasing down the emission of hydrofluorocarbon that's all regarding this news article in this discussion we saw about cool coalition its significance its action process and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the stakeholders of cool coalition now with these points in mind let us move on to the next part of the discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion today we have four questions for discussion i'll solve three of them and as usual one of them is a quiz question for you now let us take this first question for a discussion as you can see it is a previous year question which was asked in the year 2017 The first statement says the Election Commission of India is a five-member body. See, the statement is incorrect. It is a three-member body. As of now, there is one Chief Election Commissioner and two Election Commissioners. Statement two: Union Ministry of Home Affairs decides the election schedule for the conduct of both general elections and by-elections. See, if you had listened to our discussion very carefully, then you know that this statement is incorrect because. Election Commission of India is only mandated to fix the election schedule. Now coming to statement 3, Election Commission resolves the disputes relating to splits, merges of recognized political parties. See this statement is correct. So the correct answer to this question is option D3 only. Now moving on to the second question, governor can reserve a bill for consideration of the president in which of the following cases? If the bill endangers the position of state high court if it is opposed to the directive principles of state policy against the larger interest of country see governor can reserve a bill for the consideration of the president when the bill violates the constitution or if it is against directive principles of state policy he can reserve if the bill conflicts with the union powers and also if the bill is against the larger interest of the country and people and finally he can reserve the bill if the bill endangers the position of high court and the state so the correct answer to this question is option d 1 2 and 3 now moving on to the third question which of the following statements describe gdp of a country a it is the income earned by all factors of production in an economy b it is the total expenditure incurred by all entities on goods and services within the domestic boundaries of a country C it is the monetary or market value of all goods and services produced within the borders of the country and D all the above see from our discussion itself we know that these are all three methods of gdp calculation so it describes gdp of a country so the correct answer is again option D all the above now aspirants look at this question see it is only the quiz question for the day read the question it is also our previous a question think about it and post your answer in the comment section aspirants i have given here the mains questions for your practice so if you are interested write it and post your answer in the comment section if you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today post that also in the comment section with this we have come to the end if you find the video useful like share and comment and do subscribe to shankar ai's academy's youtube channel for further updates thank you